All right. All right. If you'd like to turn with me, please, in the Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 11. We're uh, working our way consecutively through the book of Acts when I speak, and I'm going to read the first 18 verses of Acts, chapter 11. And a lot of it will be familiar to you because a lot of it is a repetition of what we saw in Acts, chapter 10. And it's kind of the same story. Uh, but with a different purpose behind it. So beginning verse one, it says, the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that uh, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, thou wentest into men uncircumcised. And didst eat with them. And Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, uh, <clears throat> a certain vessel descend as it had been a great sheet, uh, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately uh, there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. <clears throat> and the Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the, the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I should withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us <clears throat> this morning. One of the key ideas in the book of Acts is the trauma of transition, the difficulty of change. They didn't like being changed. They didn't like the changes that were being brought in. And uh, if you want to put it another way, it, it's really a record, not only of the expansion of the church, but the ongoing Jewish resistance to change at every point. And so that's what really they, it's about. Stephen's sermon uh, is about their resistance to change. If you look back at Acts 7, 51, uh, he concludes his sermon. And he says this to them in verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So here's a people that are constantly resisting the changes the Holy Spirit wants to bring. And they've got a track record of it. They're just constantly doing it. Now, it leads to a very important question. What should our attitude be towards change? Because we're no different than them. We find change difficult. We all pretty much sit in the same seats, right? And somebody else 
gets there before us, a visitor, and sits in our seat, it disturbs us. I mean, we're kind of, our equilibrium is messed up for the whole session, right? And so that just tells us what we're like. We don't like change, of, of, even of the slightest kind. And so you can see that they, they have a difficulty with change, and we do too. And so what should our attitude be? Well, let's just notice the different types of change that they resisted. I want to mention two uh, that really are relevant to our considerations today. One is when God introduced something new, a new dispensation, for instance, like we're seeing here in the book of Acts, they resisted it. And that's why you could say you're resisting the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is bringing these changes, right? We're going from the the age of law to the age of grace. We're going from uh, the age where law dominates to the age where the Holy Spirit is dominant. And they resisted that. And you can understand to a certain degree because that former dispensation, the dispensation of law, had been given by God, right? So it was a God-given thing. And they practiced it pretty much. I mean, a lot of failure along the way, but generally they practiced it for 1,500 years as a nation. So suddenly to say, okay, we've got to change. I know we're not going to, we've been doing this for 1,500 years. I mean, don't you tell me we're going to change, right? You can see where they're coming from. They find this very difficult. So there's the sense in which uh, there's this resistance to dispensational change. But another change that they struggled with was that during the dispensations, whatever dispensation it was, you pretty much see that when God begins it, not long after the start of the new dispensation, there's failure, usually pretty quickly. And there's departure and there's failure in every dispensation. And so God would raise up prophets who would speak to them about their departure. And they resisted that message too. They didn't like to hear the prophets say, consider your ways. <laughs> uh, they didn't like to do that. And so they were stubborn and they resisted. Uh, when the message came, you're off track. You're not living out the reality of what has been revealed to you. They didn't like that. They resisted it in every step of the way. And so they resisted both types of change. So that comes down to us. What should our attitude be towards change? But what we say is this, that there's certain things in this dispensation that should never change until the rapture. And what I mean by that is the church truth that has been revealed in the word of God is not negotiable. There's a behavior that is appropriate to the house of God, 1 Timothy 3, 15, that has been given by God and we have no business changing that, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's, there should be a loyalty uh, absolutely to the non-negotiable truths. We just need to figure out what those are and obey them, right? So that's, that's very important. However, in this church age, it's very evident that all of us tend to depart from God's ideal, individually and collectively. That's why in the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, this is church age, five out of the seven of those churches, the Lord tells them repent. Now, that word repent means change, right? Change your mind with a corresponding change of action. And so clearly it's possible in this dispensation to, to have had truth revealed to us and either to depart from that truth or not live up to the reality of it. And so we, we need to change where we've departed, where we failed to live up to the high standards of the word of God. We need to repent. And if we don't, there are consequences. The Lord said to one of the churches, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. In other words, your testimony will end if you don't repent, right? And uh, I've seen, sadly, there are many assemblies that I used to speak in that don't exist anymore. Now, why is that? And I don't want to analyze all the deep, but, but somewhere along the line, perhaps there was this resistance to change that resulted in the lampstand being removed. Maybe they weren't living up to the ideal that they knew the word of God says. And as a result of that, they ended up 
having the lampstand removed. Or one of the churches, he said, you make me sick. I'm going to spew you out of your mouth, of my, my, of my mouth. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? And so we certainly need to be willing to change where we're not living up to the biblical standards God intends for us. And I hope that we never become resistant to change in that biblical sense of the word. Yes, some things cannot change and must not change, but other things must change. I must change, right? I'm supposed to be constantly being changed into the likeness of my Savior. And yet I struggle and I resist that sometimes because self wants to dominate rather than Christ, right? And so every one of us struggle with change. It's not easy. And so there's a sense in which we should be uh, those that are not resistant to change. But you see, one of the reasons why we get resistant to change is we get defensive. Because change implies failure. And human pride hates to acknowledge failure. And so there's a certain sense in which maybe as a church, we don't want to change because it implies, well, maybe we didn't do something right. And that admits acknowledging failure and the old flesh and the old pride doesn't want to ex ex accept that we've failed in any way. And so <clears throat> we, we need to be sure that we're willing to change and we do not refuse to hear when God is speaking to us. Now, much of this section, in, as I've already mentioned, in Acts chapter 11, repeats the story from Acts chapter 10 emphasizing that this is very important. God is bringing a massive change here because God is now taking the gospel to the Gentiles. That's a big change. And so that's why it's emphasized with such uh, repetition. And we'll think more about that as we continue. But it's also an amazing chapter in that there's a contrast in this chapter that we, we won't get to do the whole chapter today, but uh, I want to just point it out because I think it's very significant that there's two definite sections in this chapter. The first section is verses 1 through 18, and it, it's about this resistance to change. It's when, when the circumcision party in Jerusalem hear that Peter has actually eaten with Gentiles, they come and they criticize. There's a criticism <laughs> There's a contention about the change. The second section, which is from verse 19 to 30, is about the, about the church in, in Antioch and how instead of sending people from Jerusalem to criticize in the first section, they send somebody from Jerusalem called Barnabas, and he encourages, which is a real contrast. I want you just to look at verse 22 and 23 of chapter 11, where it says, the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. So he saw the grace of God at work, he was glad about it, and he encouraged them to press on and cleave to the Lord. So on the one hand, you got these are the circumcision party, and they contend and they criticize. you got Barnabas who comes along, and he really encourages them. And so, again, we have to ask the question, am I a critic or am I an encourager? <laughs> That's a good question to ask, isn't it? Sometimes it's easier to be an armchair critic than it is to be an encourager. And uh, some of us are good at it. Uh, some of us sports people, you know, we sit on the sidelines and we criticize the team and we're putting no effort in whatsoever. We're just on the sideline watching we say, well, <laughs> as if, you know, I'd do a better job if I was playing. And it's so easy to be that armchair critic, isn't it? And actually do nothing ourselves. That's challenging. Anyway, let's get, dig into the passage just to kind of observe what is our attitude towards change are we resisting change? Are we encouraging the right kind of change? That's the question this chapter would ask us. So in verse 1, it says, The apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. 
So the conversion of Cornelius and his household, one of the most significant events in the early church, second only to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in the amount of space devoted to it. That interesting. Three chapters devoted to the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Nine and chapter 21, I think. And anyway, yeah, I think there's three. Anyway, here, two chapters in direct connection with Cornelius's conversion. And so Luke wants us to see these stories are of pivotal importance in the development of the story of redemption. First of all, the apostle to the Gentiles is saved, and now the first Gentile is saved. This is really important. This is, this is a vital part of information we need to understand. Notice, again, in, in verse 1, it says uh, that they, the word had reached Jerusalem, that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. I want you to notice that phraseology, received the word of God, because it's kind of a, a repetition of an idea you'll find in the text. Look at chapter 8. When the Samaritans heard the gospel, it says in verse 14 of Acts 8, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Here in 11.1, 1, they heard the Gentiles had received the word of God. And back in chapter 2, the passage we're going to be studying at our Bible study, uh, verse 41, <clears throat> concerning the Jews on the day of Pentecost, it says, 2.41, they that gladly received his word were baptized. So in each case, you've got this idea of receiving the word of God, right? The Jews received his word, chapter 2, verse 41. The, the Samaritans, chapter 8, verse 14, they received his word, and now the Gentiles have received his word. And so it's interesting to, to think about this because what it's telling us really is that receiving his word is synonymous with conversion, with people getting saved, with people trusting in the finished work of Christ. It's those that gladly receive his word. And so for Luke, coming to faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the word of God are parallel expressions. And, and I think that's important because that's how a person does get saved. It's, it's receiving his word. It's receiving what God says in his word about ourselves, that we're hell-deserving sinners, and about the Savior, that he's the only Savior who can save a man from his sin through his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection. And so to receive his word, and of course, we, we think of Romans 10, 17, one of my favorite verses, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so <laughs> these that, that are now constituting the church, there's one common thing. They receive his word. They receive his word. They receive his word. They're, they're receivers. They're receiving the word of God. And, and, and they're not rejecting the word of God. They're receiving the word of God concerning Christ. And, of course, we want to be sure that we're someone that has received his word, that there was a point in time where we received his word. We, we, we understood what he was saying to us, that, yes, we were sinners, and yes, we needed a savior, and Christ was that savior, and we received it by faith. That was the turning point in our lives. And so instead of rejoicing in chapter 11, <laughs> that the Gentiles had also received the word of God, and you would have thought that that would have brought joy to them. It says, verse 2, when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. They're having a go at him. And why? What is the reason that they're contending with him? It says, because you went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. They're not like Barnabas, who when he saw the grace of God was glad. What they're saying, is, seeing is one infraction of their system that is really making them mad. <laughs> they're not seeing the grace of God at all. The Gentiles have received the word of God. They should have been thrilled with that. But they're contending over it. Now, here's an interesting thing. It says, when Peter had come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. Now think about that for a minute. Who in the Jerusalem church wasn't circumcised of the men? I mean, <laughs> they all were, right? And yet, 
he says there's some in that church, everybody circumcised, but some of them, that is their thing. That's their major doctrine. That's what they hold. They're the circumcision, we might say, the circumcision party. They're the ones that are saying, is it possible that a man could ever be saved and not be circumcised? See, this is going to be developing, isn't it? Acts 15. You know, do they have to be circumcised in order to be saved? Do they have to become Jews in order to become Christians? You see, that's going to be a big issue. Not just here in the epistles. Galatians, right? Do you have to be circumcised in order to be saved? So this circumcision party, they have elevated circumcision to such a degree that it's become what they're known for. They're the circumcision party. And they're upset. And they contend with him. They... And of course, contending implies criticism. He's done something wrong. And what is it? What well, he went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. So this is the accusation. You, you've eaten with these uncircumcised people. Now, again, we, we have to think about this for a moment. This strong Judaistic element in the early church, which would continue to be a, a, a point of contention. God had spoken to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, and he said that through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Praise God for that. And now it's starting to happen. The nations are starting to experience blessing. This Cornelius, this Gentile, has received the gospel. But the Jews still, this particular party, felt that in order to be accepted, they had to become Jews first. Had to get circumcised first. That was the important thing. And, and so it became a, a huge, huge issue. And so they, they're making this sweeping accusation that you went into men uncircumcised and did eat with them. And here's the interesting thing about having a critical spirit is that, that we make, we're, we're quick to, ru to rush to judgment without knowing all the details. Right? That's a critical spirit sees something and immediately makes a judgment and criticizes because it doesn't fit what I think should be happening. And what we're going to see in the rest of the chapter is that he explains why he ate with Gentiles and what the background story was. And when you understand the background story, you see that Peter's in obedience to the Holy Spirit in what he's doing. You've got to have the rest of the story. And so people with a critical spirit are quick to judge on outward appearances and first impressions without knowing the full facts. And so one thing that we need to make sure we do as we deal with one another is make sure we know how to ask questions and understand the full facts before we rush to decisions. That'd be a good practice, wouldn't it? Uh, understand what's going on. Talk to people, ask questions, establish the full picture before rushing to premature judgments on matters. And it's very easy to do that. I think I've told a story about speaking at Turkey Hill and uh, the youth camp, and there was a, a guy sat there with big long hair and all the rest of it. And I thought, I'm going to give this guy the gospel. I mean, I just thought, it turns out he was one of the counselors. <laughs> It was Darren Wilkins. Wilkins. He was a cop that was uh, was working as an undercover drugs officer, and so there's a story behind the long hair and the hippie looks, right? He was doing that to sell drugs to uh, to hippies, so he could uh, to, to sorry, sell drugs to people, so he could arrest them. And so I'm looking at all this, and I'm making an immediate rush to judgment. This guy needs the gospel. Isn't that easy? How we do that? We, we, we rush to judgment, and often we make wrong judgments when we base it just on outward appearance and initial reaction without finding out more details. And so, verses 4 through 17, he explains the real events to them. Yet it looks suspicious, yet it didn't match their preconceived ideas, uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, we're going to see, as we look at verses 4 through 17, God was in it. <laughs> That's the important thing. God was in this. And we need to see that. In Caesarea, the power of the gospel had broken the resistance of Simon Peter 
and had now broken down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. Think about that. Remember that middle wall of partition that, that you know, the Jews on one side, but well, that, that was now a crack in that wall. The, the grace of God had broken over that wall and reached out to a Gentile household. And from now on, there would be no stopping the advance of the gospel. The very last hindrance, that Jew-Gentile uh, division was about to be swept away and the gospel could run freely to the ends of the earth. But nevertheless, it's not without opposition. And that's another very important lesson spiritually. Where great advances have been made in the expansion of the gospel, there's always been spiritual resistance. And that resistance has not always come from outside the church. Sometimes it's come from within the church. And so we think of uh, the reformers, the professing church, were the greatest opponents of the Reformation, weren't they? Whether they were real, really the, the church or not. But the bottom line is it was people who professed to be Christians who persecuted those early reformers and burned them at the stake. When the Methodists began to evangelize, every door to every Anglican church, pretty much in the nation, with one or two exceptions, was closed to the preaching of Whitfield and Wesley. The gospel was going forward, masses were being reached, but the greatest opponent wasn't the mobs. And often, if the mobs were there, they were whipped up by the clergy. The resistance was from the professing church. And even the early days of the Brethren movement, a lot of the opposition and awful things written about these men, accusing them of all kinds of things, was written by professing Christians. So we have to recognize that if we're going to move forward, there may be some kickback. And it might even be in this assembly from us. Right? Because it disturbs our status quo mentality and it makes us a bit nervous and we're used to the way things are and somebody comes in and shakes things up there's a chance that we could kick back we could get defensive we could get instead of kind of asking questions maybe we do need to make some changes maybe we do need to think through some of these things yeah we can't change the principles that are there in the word of god but there may be some changes we can make maybe five clear reasons peter gives that this was a definite act of god and so the first one that he relates to them is the god-given vision notice he says in <clears throat> verse um, four peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them saying i was in the city of joppa praying and in a trance i saw a vision a certain vessel descent as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners and it came even to me. I want you to notice the first point that we need to get to, by the way. Yeah, this is a God-given vision, but it was a God-given vision to a man. And what was the man doing when the vision was given? It says, I was in the city of Joppa praying. Isn't that interesting? And then the vision comes to him when he's praying. The church began in a prayer meeting. The, the, the Church had difficulties, and they got together, and they prayed. Here again, here's a man praying, and he gets a vision from God. If we want to see what the Lord wants for us for the future, the first place we need to do is get in the place of prayer. Say, okay, Lord, do you want us to change? Well, give us a vision. Show us what you want us to do, where you want us to change, what, what is non-negotiable, and what we can change, and where we need to change, and where we're failing. That show us that, and, and it begins in the place of prayer. But God gave a vision, and a clear vision. And it was concerning these dietary laws, because <clears throat> these dietary laws really affected uh, everyday lives of every Jew. Uh, the Hellenists, the, the Jews that had uh, kind of grown up in the Greek world, part of the reason that they had stayed so separate as a nation was they're dietary laws. It's very difficult to sit down and eat with somebody if they've got so many dietary issues. 
right? That's getting increasingly a problem with hospitality, isn't it? Because half the people you invite, they're on a gluten-free or they're on this or they're on that. And you're like, what do I cook for them anymore, right? And then kids are so picky these days too. It's like, what do we, how do we begin, right? Well, you can imagine how strict the Jewish diet was. It made sitting down and having a sandwich with a, a Gentile really difficult. And it worked well. It worked very well in keeping them separate and not be contaminated by the paganism that surrounded them. It had a good purpose. But now, God is breaking that middle wall. And somehow, somebody's got to sit down at table with Cornelius and tell him how to get saved. And so, we've got to do something about these burdens and laws. And so, how does that happen? Well, God gives this amazing vision. This net coming down from heaven. And he says... <clears throat> He says, upon verse 6, the which, um, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered. So he's, he's looking at this net come down. He's thinking about it. He's meditating on it. He, and then he sees in it four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, not so, Lord. Isn't that an interesting don't you think there's a little bit of a contradiction in terms there? Like if it's Lord, you don't say not so. You say yes, right? But he said not so, Lord. Why? Because, because I've never eaten anything unclean before, Lord. I mean, you're asking me to do something that I feel really uncomfortable with. <clears throat> he says nothing common or unclean at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. Now, again, this vision includes a voice from heaven saying, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So now what he's saying is, these foods that, if you look at the book of Leviticus, they're all described as unclean, 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 unclean. Now he says, what God hath cleansed. Now they're clean. You can eat them now. You can eat lobster now, if you can afford it. <laughs> you can eat it. You can eat all of those things that were once part of the restricted diet of Judaism. He says, what well, God has cleansed, call it, and it, this was done, notice it says, this was done three times, and all were drawn up again to heaven. Just an interesting aside, and you might want to pursue this in your own study, but there's a lot of three times in the life of Peter. I just find these things incidental, but they're, they're, they're pretty interesting. Uh, for instance, how many times did Peter deny his Savior? Three times. How many times did the Lord Jesus say to him, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? Three times, right here in his recommissioning. And now three times this net comes down, telling him, rise, kill, and eat. And so the Lord is saying to Simon... <laughs> Uh, he said to him, I'm, I'm speaking to you, and I'm making sure there's no mistake. Three times, right? This is an affirmation. I want this to happen. A threefold cord is not e easily broken. Uh, I want you to act upon this. So that's the first element, that this God-given vision. The second one is the six witnesses of the event that were there, because witnesses are always important, especially when, you know, if Peter says, oh, well, this, this, uh, this is what happened, and there was no witnesses to it, they might say, well, there's nobody to prove it. It doesn't stand up in court. You've got to have witnesses. And, and so we find, verse 12, it says, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And so there are six men going to witness the gospel come to Cornelius' household and the spirit falling upon them, and they're going to be able to testify. Now, this is double what's required to have a legal testimony. Deuteronomy 19.15 says that everything must be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and God goes the extra length and says, I'm going to double it. We're going to have six witnesses. So there's no question about Peter's story. There's no making things up here. This is, this is verified 
by six witnesses. And then the third thing is the spirit bidding him to go. Notice verse 12. And the spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. And so <clears throat> it's amazing really to think about this. See, Peter, by nature, as we know, was an impetuous man. But the one thing about this whole incident was the Holy Spirit is impressing upon us how Peter's natural impulses were made subject to the Spirit of God. See, Peter's natural impulses, I've never eaten anything unclean. I'm not going. But the Spirit of God made it very evident to him. You go. You don't doubt. You, you do this, right? So God's Spirit is affirming this is the direction. Now, again, if there's to be change in our assembly, I think it starts with prayer, and then I believe the Spirit of God will make it very clear the direction we're to take. But we better not resist it. <laughs> I'll resist Him. We better respond. And so <clears throat> we certainly can see here that the Holy Spirit is leading in this whole thing, and it's all done decently and in order. And it's not left to Peter's whims and his will. But the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Don't doubt the vision. Don't doubt the, the instructions to go with this man and eat with him. Don't doubt any of this. You follow this path. And you uh, obey the Spirit's promptings. And so it says, he showed us how he uh, so it gets to the man's house. And it says, he showed us. Verse 13, how he'd seen an angel in his house. I just want to imagine, you know, I like to put myself in the picture here. Uh, you imagine him in Cornelius' household. He said, you know, what happened is, while I was praying, an angel, and actually he stood right there, and he told me to send me. You can just imagine him telling the story. I mean, like, it's not every day you see an angel, you know, and, 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 and he knew it was an angel. He said, and he stood right there, that angel, and he told me to go get you. And so he, he reiterates the story. Send men to Joppa, call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. And then this amazing statement, look at verse 14, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. I want you to get this. Cornelius was not saved by works, but by words. Isn't that interesting? You see, he did good works, right? It tells us that in chapter 10, he was feared God with all his house, gave much alms to the people, prayed to God always, and yet he needed to hear words whereby he must be saved. See, people are not saved by works. They're saved by words. The words of the gospel. That's what saves men. Hearing and believing that message. And he'll he, he tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And again, we said last time, but it's good to repeat. Here's an unsaved man's prayer being answered. Because it's sincere. And God moving his servant and even an angel and the spirit of God getting involved so that this man can hear the gospel. Isn't it amazing the lengths God goes to so a man can hear the gospel? Incredible. Isn't it? This is the heart of God. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost, this is the fourth major piece of evidence that this was a God thing. As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. So the descent of the Holy Spirit on the audience, and we know that it was the, 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 the common denominator was this speaking in tongues. That's how they knew the Spirit had fallen upon them on the day of Pentecost. That's how they knew it had fallen on Cornelius' household. So the Spirit of God has given us evidence to the Jews that God is accepting Gentiles. This is important because, remember, new dispensation, new things are happening, and often when there's new dispensation, there's a display of the miraculous to let people know, convince them, I'm doing something new here. And so this speaking in tongues was a very important thing in that it was affirming that this indeed was the same spirit that had fallen on them as at the beginning. And so he's telling them this, that what happened in that Gentile home that day was exactly the same thing as had happened in the upper room. God was now receiving Gentiles just as he had received the Jews. And then it says, 
And remember I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He understood. He remembered. He was, he was caused to bring to remembrance that what the Lord had said. And then he says this, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. I like that. God gave them the like gift as he gave unto us. You see, it's interesting, Second Peter, Peter obviously kept this in his mind, because in Second Peter, he talks about them having like precious faith. It means of the same value as that of the apostles. They have like precious faith. Why? Because they had received the like gift, the same gift, the same spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost fell on them, Cornelius' household, when they believed the gospel. And that same Holy Spirit, the day that you were saved, came and placed you into the body of Christ and he came and lived within you and you became part of this church, this universal body of Christ for the day you were saved. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And so we see the descent of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We see number five is God who gave the like gift. Same in value same in essence it's the very same spirit that fell on us fell on them and so as he considers these five lines of argument that he's presenting to them that this is a god thing this is not a man thing i didn't just decide in my own kind of mind i think we need to go and sit down and eat with the gentiles this is god doing this and so he says for as much then as god gave them the light gift as he did is who believed on the lord jesus christ what was i that I should withstand God. It's wonderful, isn't it, when the leading of God is so clear that you know that to, to, to resist it, to reject it, would actually be withstanding God. That's the kind of guidance we need. We want to move forward. We want the Lord to make it so clear that we would know if we don't do this, we're actually withstanding God. We're actually uh, standing against him. We're, we're, we're rebelling against his will. And so the, the, the result of this evidence presented was so remarkable. It says in verse 18, when they heard these things. Now, these are the representatives of the circumcision party. They don't want to be convinced, really, because this goes against everything they believe and stand for. But when they heard these things, they held their peace. See, when they got the full story, it shut their mouths. They should have kept their mouths shut before they heard the full story, but now they've heard the full story, it shut their mouths. <laughs> it says when they heard these things, they held their peace. But then they couldn't hold their peace because it says they glorified God. They recognized this is a God thing. God is doing this, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance of life. God is now allowing the possibility that Gentiles could be saved on the same basis as anybody else by faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing. Repentance of life made available to the Gentiles. So by way of conclusion, how do we relate to change? There are things that ought not to change. They're biblical for this dispensation, should continue until the rapture. They're not negotiable. However, in areas where we fail to live up to the New Testament standard, we ought to be more than ready to change, willing to change. Repent is the word used in the letters to the seven churches. But in order to repent, there has to be an honest consideration about our true state. Are we really living like New Testament believers? Are there areas where failing in that? Is there a form of New Testament Christianity? But in many ways, the life is lacking. We've got, to, we've got to be willing to look at these things and be honest in the presence of God. And if there's a need for repentance and change, we should be willing. Then we need to be sure that it's the Holy Spirit who is leading us in direct answer to believing prayer. It all began 
when Peter was praying on a housetop. And if we really want to move forward, we've got to get to the place of prayer. Say, Lord, you want us to change. That's a good prayer to begin, right? Now, where do you want us to change? How do we make the changes? By your spirit, make it very clear to us. And Lord, deliver us from any resistant spirit in our hearts. Maybe because we're defensive. Maybe because we're, we, we have to admit some failure. And that goes against the grain of the old flesh to admit. Because it would not be what we should do. And if we can come to that place, I believe the Lord could really help us to change. In a marvelous way. In a way that would magnify the Lord so that people would have to glorify God and they'd have to acknowledge no it's, it's a real God thing that he did there at Southeast Bible Chapel it's a real God thing he was really working in people's hearts making them willing uh, make, uh, making them search their hearts and see where am I failing where am I not being what I ought to be and and then he alone will be glorified because we'll all be able to say, wasn't it wonderful to be part of that God thing <laughs> that he did amongst us in 2022? May God encourage us with these thoughts. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for the word of God. We're thankful that even though uh, these events happened over 2,000 years ago, we, we feel keenly the relevance of them to our hour and our moment in history. Lord, we do need to change. There's no doubt. There are things that don't need to, but there are things that do need to. Uh, we need to be more like your son, the Lord Jesus, than we already are. Uh, we meet, need to be a, a, a more bright lampstand shining in the darkness than we are. Uh, we need to be more effective in every area of assembly life. And we need to be more a people of prayer. So, Lord, we ask you would change us, and we ask that we wouldn't fight you, but we'd comply with you. And that people would see for themselves what thou art doing amongst us. We'll give thee the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.